this morning's first scripture reading from the Old Testament from the prophet Haggai I'll be reading from the second chapter the first nine verses and if you're using a red church Bible that can be found on page 916 again the prophet Haggai I, second chapter first nine verses In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Speak to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people. Ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? But now, be strong, Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord, and work. For I am with you declares the Lord Almighty. This is what I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, and my spirit remains strong among you. Do not fear. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place, I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. May the Lord add his blessing. Our second reading this morning is from the 12th chapter of Hebrews, verses 18 through 29. And that begins on page... 1170 in the church Bible. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them, because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all men, to the spirits of righteous men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things. 
so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This is the word of our Lord. You know, Bill, in retirement, I think you ought to try to get a contract and read scripture and put it on tape or something. <laughs> you just do a great job. Between you and Nick, boy, you bring the house down. Uh, and keep uh, Nick and Tiffany uh, in your thoughts and prayers as well. They made the trip this past weekend to Tennessee. Uh, let's pray together. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we give you this time, and may we sense your presence, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, folks, this morning, with a heavy heart, I want to uh, speak to you about what happened at the Capitol building on Wednesday when they went to uh, count the electoral college votes. And I'm not referring to some members in Congress who wanted to uh, have discussion and make objection. I'm referring to the storming of the Capitol building, um, violence, the destruction, the mob mentality that all of us saw on TV by now. I did not agree with what took place in our cities this past summer. I did not agree with what took place on Wednesday. It was nothing short of tragic, sad, unfortunate, disgraceful, and distasteful. Uh, the scriptures tell us, blessed are the peacemakers, pursue peace, be at peace with all men, if possible, the scripture says. So, violence is not the rational, mature, civil, and educated response. Amen? It's just not. Um, people want to see, hope for, anticipate, we've come to expect better in our country. We're not, as they say, a banana republic. Now, that being said, I am not surprised, though, at what happened. Uh, not surprised at all. Uh, but not surprised is not to be interpreted in any way as sanctioning what happened. You know how people say, well, he wasn't surprised, therefore I think he supported it. No, not saying that at all. I do not sanction what happened, but I believe I understand why it happened. Given, and I, I'd like to explain that today. Given the political discourse between the politicians, the media, the social elites in our country, basically those who run things politically, socially, uh, socially, economically, and academically, it was just a matter of time before it happened. You could see that. Now, add into the mix the belief, at the very least, the perception that there was a fixed election. Why wouldn't we expect something like this? I mean, you know, it's like one plus one. It adds up pretty easily. So I ask you the question this morning, where is all that political energy supposed to go? Where? Furthermore, what do we expect in a society where God and the Holy Scriptures are ignored, thrown out, marginalized, and discounted? What do we expect when the American dream is no longer about freedom and life and liberty and pursuit of happiness? What do we expect when it has become about the love of money and godlessness and greed? What do we expect when many have been left behind socially and financially? What do we expect when there are crooked politicians and failed policies coming down from the top? It's like Nero fiddling while Rome's burning. I'm not surprised at what happened on Wednesday. If you look at Hebrews chapter 12, it's a sobering passage, and it provides a very, very quick contrast and basic summary. God has spoken from Mount Zion in the past. It's historical. It's documented. And even Moses, who met with God daily in the tent of meeting, 
he was terrified and trembled. The whole mountain shook. It was doom and gloom. And yet the contrast here is, but God has now spoken to us through his son. And it doesn't have to be terrifying uh, experience. And it doesn't have to be doom and gloom. We have come to heavenly Mount Zion to the church of the firstborn. And yet, if you read the scripture here, there is still a day coming where he, he's going to shake every created thing. That will be doom and gloom. That will be a horrific and horrifying experience. And so what we have here is a clarion call to be grounded in Jesus Christ. We have a call and a warning from God, from heaven, to be found in Jesus Christ. And to ignore his word and this warning is to build on things that are going to be shaken. And folks, uh, we have been building on things other than Jesus Christ in this country for a very, very long time. And they're being shaken. The foundation of our democratic republic is coming apart because we have ignored God. Our institutions are crumbling and shaking because we not, have not listened to the Almighty. We have ignored history. We have ignored him who has spoken from heaven. And this is why we're having the tremendous problems in our country today. This is a scriptural truth. The spiritual always governs the physical. And this is why this message today is spiritually and politically relevant for all of us. Now, uh, for those of you who love our country but stay on the political fringe and, fringe, and I know that there are some of you here that don't care for politics and don't really follow it and don't want to weigh into the fray, and I understand that. But I, I need to state the politically obvious this morning, and I hope that you do not find this message painful, but sobering in light of God's judgment, because it's falling on our nation. I also want to say that churches have ignored the political debate for a very, very long time. And I have tended to uh, jump in at times and pull back, because I know it's divisive. But this may actually be one of the reasons why our country is the way it is. The church has pulled back. The church has actually uh, been marginalized years ago through an IRS rule that they used as a cudgel to force the churches from staying out of politics. But the churches and the ministers were ver and, and very, very much involved at the founding of our country. They were the moral conscience, the Jiminy Cricket of our fa the fabric of our society. Uh, that rule, by the way, the IRS rule years ago, was, several years back, was struck down as unconstitutional. Praise God for that. So I, I, I bring this political topic up this morning because it's heavy upon my heart, and I hope it's not painful upon yours, but sobering. And, and remember, I, as I said a little bit earlier, uh, and I prayed this in my prayer, although I didn't expect to, but the political affects the social, and that will affect us spiritually, and, and whether we will have the ability to worship, to gather at church, and to live free and, and be free. It's going to affect our very, very way of life if we're not concerned about it. This... this ought to matter to everyone. You know, uh, some of us, we, you know, we want to be like the ostrich and bury our head in the sand and hope that everything will go away someday. It's going to go away someday, but probably not as soon as we would like. And, and you know, I started working on this message on Thursday, and a lot has changed since Thursday. Uh, we now see censorship in full bloom, right? by the high-tech companies. And brothers and sisters, this is not going to stop here. Mark my words, it's not. It's going to be a juggernaut. We've already seen the tyranny of government during COVID-19. There is absolutely no excuse, and I've said this for weeks. Do your research, there's no excuse for how they're shutting everything down. None. 
So, oh, follow the science. If you follow the science, there's no excuse. But they're doing it. And it's about control and manipulation. And many of you recognize that. But it's not politically correct to say it, is it? This is not going away anytime soon. Have you seen the movie The Patriot? Years ago, Mel Gibson. It was about the Revolutionary uh, War, um, I believe. And anyway, um, it was a family. Uh, he was a war hero, but many didn't know about it. And he pretty much, uh, their family didn't want to get involved in the current political um, you know, rumblings. And, and they tried to stay out of it. But the tyranny of government and British troops came to their home, killed their son, burned down their house, and he had to get involved. But he just, he didn't really want to get involved. He wanted it all to go away. It's coming to your house. Right? It's coming to your house. I know we want it to go away, but it's coming to your house. So I'm going to give you um, what I see this morning. Uh, I'm going to give you my interpretation of everything. Uh, first, let me say this. Uh, I had a wise biblical professor, or Bible school professor, say there's a difference between interpretation and application, and there's many, many different interpretations, but there's only one right interpretation of Scripture. And there's also numerous applications, Right? There will be many opinions and interpretations and applications of the political events that have befallen us this past week. But there's only one right interpretation, and God knows it all, and he sees it all. I'll try to keep my opinions out of it this morning. I will present my interpretation and my analysis, uh, and that is different from my opinions. And I believe my analysis is right based in, on my point of view in the room. My spiritual, political, and social views are by no means complete. But a lack of completeness does not render my interpretational assessment useless or inadequate. I'll be speaking in general principles, and yet there's always exceptions to the rule. So in, in light of what happened on Wednesday, we saw and are seeing the classic politician and political response. He did it, she did it, they did it, I didn't do it, right? True leadership, good leadership, godly leadership does not point fingers. It takes responsibility and accountability for what happens. Uh, this should tell us much about many of our politicians. Many of them are not true leaders. Many of them are not good leaders. Many of them certainly are not godly leaders. In fact, they look the part. It's amazing, you know, when you put on dress clothes, it's amazing how good you can look, right? Especially when you have a nice pinstripe suit. suit. They, they look the part, but they don't fit the part in terms of character. We have leaders who at best pay lip service to God, it is more a religious veneer than a viable living faith. And this is also true when it comes to the Constitution. It's lip service. We need godly leaders. We need leaders with character. We need leaders who love God and fear Him. We need leaders who stand on the Word of God. We need leaders who stand up for the Constitution and the Judeo-Christian values upon which it was built. That ought to give us pause for when we go to the polls. Now, the other thing I want to say too is I am under no illusion that Donald Trump fit the bill for the kind of leaders that I just said we, we need. Uh, I have an extended family member, uh, love this person dearly, uh, honor and respect them in their military service. They believe that Donald Trump is a failure in leadership. That is their assessment, and they are entitled to that. I am sure history will be the judge of this, uh, but I also hope that history will also be the judge of the other current leaders during this time. You know, the, 
the finger pointing uh, kind of reminds me of Genesis 3, and we'll be taking a look at this in several weeks in, in Wednesday night Bible study. But you know, um, God came, you know the story, God came to Adam, and Adam says, no, it was the woman. <laughs> and then the woman says, no, 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 it was the devil. And everybody wants to pass the buck. But everyone was responsible, right? And, you know, the classic knee-jerk reaction is blame Trump, right? It's a blame Trump. I suppose Donald Trump could be blamed for some things. He's not perfect. But Donald Trump can't be blamed for all things. And Trump cannot be blamed for all things that happened the other day. People took responsibility and destroyed the Capitol building. They went in. They breached it. He did not say, go in and breach the Capitol building and disrupt. He didn't say that. You could say that his words were insightful. That's for another time. But people who did that are responsible as well. Trump was not and is not the problem in our country. And before anyone shuts me down mentally, because you think he is, let me state my case in the obvious. And I would argue what happened the other day is more of a systemic problem in our country. Is Donald Trump the political piñata? Yes, he is. Should he be the political piñata? Well, it depends. If you want a politically correct answer, yes, he is. He should be. But if you're looking for an honest answer, then no, he should not be the political piñata. Instead of the classic political blame game and pointing fingers and finding a piñata, we need to ask the question, seriously, why did the storming of the Capitol building happen on Wednesday? That's a legitimate serious question to ask. And here's the problem. Everyone always wants and loves a simplistic answer, right? That, that's what they want. Blaming Donald Trump is too simplistic of an answer. The problem is a more systemic one. Now, I want you to think about this, right? Why was President Trump elected in the first place? Why did the people on the right reject all the, all the career politicians and the establishment politicians. Why? Why did they elect a businessman who promoted an America first agenda? Probably because they haven't been. And because politicians were not delivering for the people. And they were giving lip service and they were fiddling while Rome burned. That's why Donald Trump got elected. And why, and think about this, why did half the country reject Hillary Clinton for four years, four years ago? Also a career politician. Also somebody who did not promote America first, but a globalist agenda. Also paid lip service to the Constitution. She and the Democrats fiddled while Rome was burning too. Donald Trump was elected because many people feel that they're not being adequately represented anymore. That's why he was elected. And on the right, people felt that they were, or feel like they're losing their country. Their freedoms are being taken away, be it constitutionally or religious. This COVID crisis has brought these truths to light, right? And reality. I mean, thank God you don't live in... California. It's insane. And we live in a surveillance state. I challenge you to go down the highway without seeing cameras all over the place. How does that fit with the Fourth Amendment? People are encouraged to call the authorities on their fellow citizens. You know, when I was like in high school, that's what they did in the Soviet Union. And so many feel like their values are not being represented. On the left, they feel that the system isn't working for them. They see trickle-down economics. Many Americans are hand-to-mouth. They see a system that exploits the poor 
and the disadvantaged and keeps people down. Hence, the rise of socialism and Black Lives Matter. And this has led to huge entitlement mindsets because many people have been kept down. I want stuff. I want your stuff. That too is wrong. I mean, we're where in the Bible is there an entitlement expectation or mindset? Furthermore, many Americans see the justice system as corrupt. There are different sets of standards for the rich and the influential, and the politicians versus the poor and the average little guy. And it's true. If you have a lot of money, you probably fare better in court than the person who doesn't have a lot of money and you have to get like a public defender. You know, you get what you pay for, the old adage, right? Many are still waiting for the higher level operatives who spied on the Trump campaign to go to jail. Also, lobbyists own the political voice in the room. They actually own Washington. From domestic lobbyists to international lobbyists, Corporate lobbyists, private lobbyists, institutional wealth centers, they're buying political favors all over the place. That's why when you go to Washington and you serve, you become real rich because you take the lobbyist's money. And people are tired of the political shenanigans. That's why Donald Trump was elected. Americans are tired of the politics and the blame game. They're tired of politicians selling out their country. They're not getting results. They're not getting the truth. You know, they speak with forked tongue, right? The old Indian expression, you say one thing and you do another. And who gets hosed? You, the American people. Our industries and manufacturing jobs have been shipped overseas. Our dollar is losing its purchasing power. Our government schools are failing and not making the grade. School choice is scorned and mocked as an alternative, but currently requires a lot of money. Oh, by the way, if you're wealthy, you can send your kids to school choice, right? The best in the, in the country. From the great school all the way up through high school and the best colleges and universities. Our cities are major disasters and are on fire. Our seniors are struggling to make ends meet. Social security has become social scarcity. Oh, excuse me, uh, we need to take $5 away from you because you made too much this month. They actually do it. And on top of all this, government is forcing godlessness and immoral progressive social agendas down our throat. And so instead of giving the American people who are losing their jobs, like on steroids, and businesses are failing, instead of uh, giving them a sizable stimulus check, no, we'll give you $600 because we want to fund gender studies in, in, in India. That's a problem. That's a huge problem. And that's why Donald Trump was elected. You know, I, I, I try to assess things. I think uh, Americans are decent, gracious, hardworking, loving people, giving people. They love their country. They just want to live and let live. Uh, we don't want to be railroaded or coerced into some sort of social, global, financial agenda or experiment. We don't want it. And that's why people got out of control the other day. They're tired of it. People are angry and frustrated because they're not being heard. People feel like they no longer have a voice. People are tired of the political grandstanding, empty promises, wasteful spending, and the same old, same old. People want their country back. People want the, follow, the, the, the Constitution followed, generally most people, unless you're a communist. People want to have a future and a hope. They want to get ahead. They want their children to get ahead. They want their grandchildren and great-grandchildren to grow up in a great country. And yet, if you take a look, the country has turned into a bunch of haves and have-nots. We see a dwindling middle class. That's what socialism brings. 
but we also have a, a country where half the people want stuff from other people when they haven't worked for it. That's not right either. Politicians and the elites have created this economic climate and culture through failed policies. They are to blame, not Donald Trump. They have sold out to lobbyists and interest groups. They're all soiled. They have sold out the American people, both parties. That's why you see the vitriol and the discourse and the frustration on both sides. Politicians and the elites who run this country are at fault. They run the country and therefore they're ruining the country. And I don't know if it's mismanaged or intentionally managed. I don't know. But that's why you have a lot of frustration. And that's not all. Let's talk about the rule of law. Everyone since last Wednesday and this past summer has been screaming, we're a country of rules and we're a country of laws, right? And yet they're the very ones that break the laws. You know, it's like me shouting from the back, fire, fire, and yet I said it. It's crazy. They only speak when it's politically expedient and opportunistic. They never say anything when it's morally right for them to do so. Very few Democrats spoke out when the cities were on fire. Oh, it's Trump's fault. Biden was hiding. I'm glad many Republicans spoke out this past Wednesday. However, I'm deeply disturbed that they simply blamed Donald Trump. They need to blame themselves. The problem is, is that many politicians only see red, blue, or green. That's all they ever see. It's rules for thee, but not for me. And that's not a right-wing talking point. Many liberals feel the same way. These leaders expect you to wear masks, but they don't wear them themselves. There's not equal justice, it's slanted. How is it that Hillary Clinton can violate laws and put secret, sensitive information on a laptop and never get prosecuted, and yet a um, veteran is visiting an army guy, actually active army, I think, or maybe he went down to the, visited the uh, submarine base in Groton and took a selfie or a picture and they threw him in jail for nine months. It's crazy. Paul Manafort can violate financial reporting and operate with impunity for years. For years. They just looked the other way. They knew he was, everyone knew he was doing it, but when he supports Trump, now he goes to jail, you see? But if you and I were doing that for years, we would have been thrown away a long time ago. Not equal representation. Money talks. The politicians, the rich, the socially connected have lined their pockets while average Americans struggle. They take from Peter to pay Paul. And get this, Peter's not happy. You're Peter. You're not happy. And then Paul still struggles. Paul's not happy, right? And But this soothes their conscience is doing acts of virtue and kindness. But it's not on their own nickel. They didn't give their own nickel. They took your nickel. They took your children's nickel, your grandchildren's nickel, your great-grandchildren's nickel. And they've put the country in debt. They're the worst offenders. Why is it that those at the top almost never go to jail for their crimes? Why is it that the rich and the politically powerful get a pass? You know, like Monopoly, you get the get out of jail free card, politically and financially. In fact, sometimes they recycle that same card. And that fuels disparity in our culture. It fuels frustration. And it's not only about the haves and the have-nots and about getting stuff. It's about access. It's about gaming the system. It's about showing favoritism. It's looking the other way when they can make a buck or when there's a buck to be lost. You know, they just do things so they don't lose the dollar, their dollar. And so 
this social, political, economic frustration, it needs to go somewhere. The energy needs to go somewhere, folks. It went to Donald Trump in 2016. It went to the Capitol building on Wednesday of this past week. <coughs> That's where it went. You know, this past uh, Christmas, I got a book on electrical wiring. Um, I've done some wiring. Usually what happens, Noreen, is when I do electrical wiring, I call your son Doug, and he walks me through things, right? So anyway, I, um, I got a book on electrical wiring. Uh, Bob, I know you know this stuff about this. Probably Jerry, um, I don't know, Bob Campbell. I know some of you know a lot of this. So I start reading this book on electrical wiring, right? Because I've always had an interest in it. Remember, I, I went to Bible school, not a trade school, seminary, you know. And, um, but anyway, so I, I've, I've done some reading. Let me, let me give you electricity basics, all right? Uh, and um, because it's much like political energy, right? So electricity power enters the home. This power also needs to exit the home. It comes in on the hot wire and exits on the neutral wire, unvoltaged, right? The grounding wire, the green encased wire, is typically an additional outlet if you have a ground fault so the energy can go somewhere. So think of it as a front door, a back door, and a side door. The hot comes in the front door and, you know, the neutral goes out the back door and the side door is kind of like the grounding wire. The grounding wire. Back to the political situation. That's pretty much how it works politically. There's a whole lot of political energy that needs to go somewhere. It comes into the house and you have to have it grounded. It has to go someplace after it comes into the house. And failed policies do not channel away the energy. They exacerbate it. And double standards regarding the rule of law brings more political energy into the house, not less. And to top this off, many people believe that there's an election that was stolen. That's a whole lot of energy in the house. That's like bringing five, eight, ten times of what is legally required or allowed to come into a regular residential home. And it's, and it's got to go someplace. And if it's not managed, it's going to blow. Your courts, your state legislatures, your governors in the contested states, the Supreme Courts in those states, they all punted. The Supreme Court punted. And so everyone's, like, frustrated well, not everyone, but half the country's frustrated because they believe that there was some tampering in this election. And many people feel their votes didn't count, especially when dead people vote. And, and here's the point. It, it doesn't really matter if you don't believe fraud took place or not. Many saw this as a fixed election, and that's a problem. It's energy, and it has to be addressed. If you have a loose wire in an electric connection, you have to address it. And whether it's true or not, it's the perception of it. It needs to be addressed. The energy needs to go somewhere. We know that there were constitutional violations, but people wanted to look the other way, probably because they didn't want their city to burn or their house to burn. There are also some very serious statistical, computer statistical anomalies that suggest that tampering did take place. Hundreds of people, hundreds, filed affidavits under the penalty of perjury. That means they can go to jail if you're lying. And they were just dismissed. We had one whistleblower with the Russia hoax. Oh, he had to be heard. Hundreds of average Americans, oh, they can't be heard. Where does that energy go? At the very least, the anomalies should have been heard and vetted and welcomed on both sides. Rather than playing partisan politics, they should have welcomed it to diffuse the energy. Again, failed leadership, partisan leadership, godless leadership. 
And here's the electrical analogy in the point. If the energy doesn't go someplace, you have a house fire. And it, the house fire becomes a dumpster fire. What you saw was the beginning of a house fire on Wednesday. And I hope I'm wrong, but it may still burn. You know, you've got to use certain chemicals to put an electrical fire out. You just can't throw water on it. It's going to get worse if the energy is not addressed. Now, you see, the left is going to attempt to steamroll the right, right? That's what they're trying to do. People aren't going to sit on their hands and take the punishment. And it's not going to work if the right seeks to steamroll the left. And it's not going to work if the rich exploit the poor. And it's not going to work if the poor steal from the rich. And it's not going to work if we continue to push God and the Holy Scriptures out of our society. John Adams said, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. And this is where the need for God comes in. He's the grounding wire. There's the need for a moral and religious people if our system's to work. And herein lies the problem. The system is hot. The neutral and grounding wires have been removed. And it blew. A moral and religious people, that's why it's not working. And that's a message for all American people. How much more for those who govern these people of the United States? This is why we're having such problems because the people who set policy politically, economically, socially, academically, they have all ignored God. Most of them have ignored God. The founders revered God. Our government leaders have primarily frozen out the moral and religious. The founding fathers welcomed the moral and religious. Is it any wonder that we have house fires? Our people used to be God-fearing and would go to church. They don't do church anymore. Probably don't even do it online. And it's clear for all to see. America is no longer spiritually grounded. That's our problem. We're no longer grounded in God and Christian principles, in Jesus Christ. And that's why America is being shaken. From our cities to the Capitol building to every institution, and I say it with fear and trembling and mark my words, you just wait and see. God's going to bring it all down. Because we have ignored him who speaks from heaven. If you are a believer, you have been spiritually grounded. You cannot be shaken when you stand in him. But, where does the energy go? I read this passage of scripture and I see a spiritual power and energy coming from heaven. You know, we talked this morning about the political power. Where does that go? Where does this energy go? The scriptures say that God is going to shake everything that has been created. Not some things or a few things, but everything that has been created. And that includes the heavens. You know, you read Revelation, the devil's thrown down. Everything is going to be shaken. How do you deal with this? You have to be grounded in Jesus Christ. You've got to be grounded for what's coming. I'm, we, we're talking here. Now we're talking here. 
Because what's coming here is going to upset a lot of people. What's coming here is going to destroy a lot of people. It's going to destroy a lot of people here, too. I heard a political pundit, a Christian man, speak of the need for a righteousness in this country to absorb the political energy so it's not fatal. How much more so spiritually? We have many people today in our country who have unbridled anger and passion and they do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. They do not have godly morals and a spiritual grounding. That's a dangerous mix. Very dangerous. Godlessness with unbridled anger and passion. Folks, I have God in my life. And when I get angry and I get out of control, it scares the heck out of me. Can you imagine people that don't have God and get to that level? Someone was telling me of a story where a minister who was very conservative um, actually pitched his tent next to a bunch of militia groups that were gathering and meeting. I guess this happened a number of years ago. So he set up their tent in the midst with the hope that he would minister to them. Do you know that very, very few militia people came into his tent? He said it scared him. They saw little need for God. Folks, if you're a student of history, this is far, far different from the Revolutionary War. Uh, when those tents, religious tents, were popped up, people flocked to them. During the Civil War, they propped up ministerial tents. They were full and overflowing. The tents couldn't con contain them, all the people. <clears throat> Couldn't even get a few people to come into his tent. You know, I know that this message is probably not something that a lot of people want to deal with. You have to deal with it. You've got to get involved. You got to vote properly. You got to vote for godly, good leadership. One final thought. Take a look at verse 29. We forget this, don't we? Our God is a consuming fire. His truth is marching on. Things are being shaken. The fire has started. It's coming to your house. You, you can't bury your head like an ostrich. I, I wish that we would. I wish that we could. Our God is a consuming fire. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we, we believe in Holy Scripture uh, so much. Uh, we have come to heavenly Mount Zion, to a myriad of angels, and to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the church of the firstborn. And Lord, we thank you for our church today, our church family, for those that are in attendance, and we bless you for the fellowship of the saints and the fellowship that we have with the Lord Jesus. And, uh, Father, we um, tremble for our country. Uh, we're greatly concerned. And we ask and pray in this part of the vineyard that we're able to do our parts. Uh, we ask and pray, Lord, that you would give us wisdom and understanding. Um, we thank you that we... Um, that we're reminded to be angry and yet sin not. Uh, and we're, we're hopeful and we pray that 
people would have a heart uh, to listen to you, um, to hear you speak from heaven uh, through Holy Scripture. Uh, we lift up our politicians, those that um, hold influence, who set monetary policy, who push social agendas, who are in politically in charge. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would stop them in their tracks, uh, that you would bring a conviction that they wouldn't simply see Donald Trump as the problem, uh, but that you would stop them in your, their tracks, that you would bring conviction uh, top to bottom to everyone on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I pray that you would do that, Lord. And that there would be a healing, that there would be a forgiveness, that there would be pause, and that people would stop to ponder and to think about you and give you first place. That's our prayer. But in the end, we pray that your will be done. Uh, to God be the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.